in the name of God, infinite good God, whose very being is love. My dear friends, my name is Miroslav Wolf, and I'm the director of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture. And in the name of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, at, here at the Yale Divinity School, I am uh, delighted to be able to welcome you to this uh, conference, to welcome you to New Haven, to welcome you to Yale University. To come and to actively participate in this conference, many of you have taken upon yourselves inconvenience of traveling long distances while leaving at home important and often urgent work. We're all honored that you have responded to our invitation and we are delighted at your presence. We hope that you will feel home at home with us, especially those of you who have traveled from afar. Now, the staff of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, many others at the Divinity School and at the university at large, also the staff of my good friend, His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi bin Mohammed bin Talal, who is a co-host also of his conference. They, together with uh, seminarians for Har from Hartford Seminary, have worked very hard to prepare this conference and to make this, your stay here very pleasant. And I want to express to all of them my deepest gratitude, especially, I think, to the head of the reconciliation program uh, of the Yale Center for Faith and Culture, Director Joseph Cumming. Joseph has worked often nights through in order to make this uh, event uh, happen, uh, and he's, my gratitude goes to him. Thank you, thank you. And I also want to assure you that we will try to do everything we can to make your stay here as pleasant as possible. And if you have any questions, comments, needs, please do not hesitate to ask any of the staff, including myself. Now, to greet all of us, uh, I want to invite uh, the director of the Yale Reconciliation Program, Joseph Cumming, and he will do so in a way that I cannot. He will do so in the language of many of you, the beautiful Arabic language. Joseph Cumming. In the name of God Almighty, the source of all good love and his peace upon all the prophets, bless those who have, our guests who have come from far places. God, do in our hearts what you want. Uh, for you, may there be all success. Amen. In the name of the University of Yale, we want to welcome our esteemed guests and we Thank you that you have given your valuable time to attend this, this historic uh, conference uh, in the context of a common word between us that calls us to uh, interpret the Christian-Muslim relations on the basis the, of the two commandments, to live God Almighty from all our being and to live, love our neighbor as ourself. I hope that your stay with us will be wonderful. If there are any suggestions or if you can confront any problems, please come to us so that we can search for, God willing, a solution. Yes, we welcome you with all joy. And now I have the honor uh, to uh, present to you the uh, uh, president of the univers Yale University, Dr. Richard Levin. He heads up, he has headed up the Yale University for about 15 years. Welcome, Mr. President. Let me join them in welcoming all of you to this historic and truly remarkable occasion. Uh, Yale is proud and indeed thrilled to be party to what we hope will be a conversation that will, that will change the world. The work that was initiated by Prince Ghazi and a number of you and Muslim clerics around the world <coughs> last year 
in reaching out to Christians and Jews and others to point out the commonality of the traditions of, of, Mus of the Muslim faith and of, and of uh, Christianity it was an important, truly important document and, and could not come at a more important time. Because, as we know, the world is, is arrayed much too often uh, in a way that suggests that the conflict among civilizations is a preeminent fact of our time. And yet, those of, those of us in this room and many, many millions of others around the world know that this need not be the case, that indeed the Christian faith and the Muslim faith have not only common origins in, this, in, the, in the historical adherence to the ancient scripture, but indeed have central tenets such as are articulated in the common word document, which truly ought to bring all of us together uh, and to recognize that in our common appreciation of one God and of the importance of loving thy neighbor, there is a foundation on which to build a durable and lasting common vision, a friendship, a toleration, a coexistence that will make for a, for a healthier, more peaceful and more prosperous world. It is to that vision, as articulated by Prince Ghazi and 137 other Muslim clerics last year in the Common Word document that this conference is dedicated and that this entire program, which will build upon this conference uh, with subsequent events uh, in, um, in England and in, and in Italy and in Jordan, uh, will hope to, to bring to culmination a true collaboration and a spreading of the idea throughout both the Christian and, uh, and uh, Muslim worship communities that, uh, that there is indeed a common underpinning of these two faiths and, and a common basis for appreciating difference and for recognizing uh, the legitimacy of each other's uh, perspective. It's a great enterprise and one that we are very pleased to be part of and, part, and, and we hope to nurture in every way we possibly can. I'm very much indebted to Professor Wolf and for his vision and to Dean Harry Attridge of the Yale School of Divinity for embracing this concept and moving forward uh, to organize this conference and to put Yale in a central role in promoting uh, a dialogue of harmony. Uh, and I'm also extremely grateful and honored that uh, that, to, for, to, uh, that Prince Ghazi is, has come to, uh, as a co-organizer co of this conference and as a, a leader um, of the group <laughs> that has reached out and in its effort to promote dialogue. I wish that I could stay and spend more time with you all today, but my schedule won't permit that. But I do want to salute you in this outstanding effort, and I hope that uh, great things come of it and that as time goes on, the importance of the set of meetings that this is initiating uh, this week uh, will, will turn out to have a true historic significance in bringing Christians and Muslims together around the world. So thank you very much for your participation. Thank you, President Levin, for your remarks. Uh, President Levin is one of the truly great leaders in higher education in this country and around the world. And we have been graced by his also vision and embrace of our work uh, here. So thank you once again for all of this. So you all have responded to our call, taken upon yourselves, as I have said, inconvenience of traveling long ways and uh, uh, suffer jet lag and many other, uh, many other indignities. But why have you come here? One reason is, I assume, that you, like me, see a heavy and dangerous storm of Christian-Muslim tensions menacing the world in which we all live. Since the Crusades, relations between these two faiths, which comprise more than half of humanity, have rarely been at a lower point than they are today. Tensions, deep conflicts, and often murderous violence between our two communities are leaving a trail of blood and tears, 
as well as a large and mounting deposit of painful memories. They also undermine hopes and efforts of many to live in peace, flourishing as individuals, flourishing as communities. And as we know, stunted lives enveloped in hopelessness throw people even deeper into conflict, even deeper into violence. You have come, I take it, because you are worried about these tensions, you're worried about these clashes, and you're seeking, just as we all are, ways to overcome them. I hope, however, that you have come to this conference also because you sense that a new wind of hope is beginning to blow and that the rays of sun are penetrating the stormy darkness around us. A common word between us and you, likely, I believe, one of the most significant interfaith documents to appear in the last 40 years, common word is one such ray shining through the barely parting clouds. The thesis of this Muslim letter, endorsed by some of the most prominent Muslim leaders worldwide and addressed to Christian leaders across the globe, the thesis of this document is very simple and it is as profound as it is simple. What binds Muslims and Christians together is their common belief in the oneness of God and the commitment to love God and to love neighbor. And this same belief and the same commitment, of course, bind Christians and Muslims to their older sibling, the original Abrahamic faith, Judaism, a faith through which God has given the world these two commandments in the first place. Now, let me remind you that the common word was written not just in an atmosphere of stormy relations between Muslims and Christians. It was also written as a response to what many Muslims have experienced as a Christian provocation. Its occasion was the famous Regensburg Address of the Pope Benedict XVI delivered in 2005. In it, the Pope quoted the Byzantine emperor, who in a debate with a learned Persian Muslim said, show me just what Muhammad brought that was new, and there you will find things only evil and inhuman, such as his command to spread by the sword the faith he preached. Now, many devout Muslims across the world felt insulted. Yet despite tensions between Muslims and Christians, yet despite this seeming provocation, key Muslim leaders gathered around the common word did not respond in kind. Notwithstanding the present conflicts, they chose the path of benevolence and beneficence, not of hatred and revenge. They insisted that commitment to love God and neighbor binds together members of these two great faiths. It has been said that God knows how to ride straight, even on crooked lines. The signatories of the common word, and above all, my dear friend, His Royal Highness Prince Ghazi, a man of deep devotion to God and extraordinary practical wisdom, who is also the spearheader of this initiative, all of them, they also wrote straight on the crooked line which the present situation offered them. The whole Christian community, indeed, I believe the whole world, owes a debt of gratitude to them for having lived up to this challenge. I trust that you will not take it as self-serving if I say that another, much smaller ray of sun penetrated the stormy clouds of Muslim-Christian relations. It was the Yale response to the common word, loving God and neighbor together. Now, what was significant about this response is not that it was written or that it was written at Yale. <clears throat> what was significant was that it was endorsed by over 500 Christian leaders, many of whom, some of whom are here, but many of whom, heads of large worldwide constituencies representing literally hundreds of millions of Christians. And they signed it not only because their holy book tells them to live in peace with all people, but also because they sensed a danger 
a danger of global proportions if a peace between Muslims and Christians did not win over tensions and injustice. Of course, Yale's response was only one in the many responses that were to follow. The most recent one is a very fine letters, a letter of the Archbishop of Canterbury in response to the common word. But that simply underscores my point. The broad support of the Christian, of the common word in the Muslim community and the enthusiastic positive response to the common word in Christian community, they all give hope that we are poised to see a major change in Muslim-Christian relations. This is what the present conference is all about. Its goal is to contribute to the historic task of reconciliation between Muslims and Christians worldwide, to help them transition from clashes to mutually beneficial coexistence. But can one bring about a shift from what feels like a clash of civilization to conviviality of faith traditions? Can one bring such a shift by, discu by discussing what some people may describe as obscure and private issues of human devotion to God and promoting what others may deem soft and nebulous stances such as love? Should we not be grappling with hard realities of life? Should we not be discussing poverty and economic development, freedom of expression, education, stewardship of environment, pluralism, democracy, balance of power, resistance to extremists of all stripes, modes of countering violence with effective force? Should we not be discussing these things? We should. I will argue later. But the critic might continue, if religion has anything to do with this whole mess, religious passions of Christians and Muslims, single-minded devotion to God as champion of one's own cause is precisely the source of clashes rather than the means of their resolution and a catalyst of peaceful coexistence. So the critic will say, Less religion is what we need, not more. Take God out of it all, the critic will conclude, and let religious people keep their religious devotions locked in the privacy of their hearts. Restrict virtues and delights of love to the spheres of friendship and family. As to the worldly affairs, engage them by appealing to national interests and balance of power tempered by the claims of hard-nosed justice. That's a critic saying, so why are we organizing a major conference on love of God and love of neighbor? What worldly good can come of it? Well, we're organizing it partly because we don't think that love is a soft and nebulous emotion, but a tough practical virtue of benevolence and beneficence toward all, a virtue of which justice is an absolutely integral part. As to religion, religious people don't find their faith impractical, obscure at all. God for them is the motivating and sustaining power, the Holy One who gives meaning, who gives weight, who gives direction to their whole life. In modern terminology, faith is really what makes them tick. But it is not just the toughness, robustness of love, and it is not just this orienting, life-organizing character of faith that makes these themes socially important. Consider the undiminished vibrancy of religion in the contemporary world. To the surprise of many, especially to the surprise of the proponents of the thesis that religion will gradually retreat before the light of reason and before the benefits of technological development, especially these folks. Um, and that expectation was that the world, uh, in contrast to these expectations, the world is becoming more and more rather than less and less religious place. The data clearly shows that the world is not secularizing. If anything, it is undergoing 
a process of de-secularization. Religious states, notably Christianity and Islam, but others as well, are reasserting themselves, and they're reasserting themselves in two important senses. First, number of their adherents in the world is growing in absolute and relative terms as compared to non-religious worldviews. Second, religious people increasingly don't consider their faith simply a private affair, but are letting it shape their public engagements. Religion matters profoundly to people and matters to them in the public as well as the private sphere. Moreover, there is no sign that the trend will change in the foreseeable future. Now, I hope that you will not take my sketch of these trends as kind of highlighting, uh, in highlighting religious uh, resurgence as a statement of religious triumphalism. I'm certainly aware of the dangers of religion. I'm certainly aware how much religion has often been instrumentalized to give aura of sacred to very worldly and sometimes very base causes. I'm aware also that it has been used to legitimize, legitimize violence. But it is important to name data about religious resurgence and extrapolate about the future. And then to draw attention to the significant consequence of these trends. What is this consequence? Well, negatively, if religion matters, if religion will continue to matter to large numbers of people in the world today, no peace between religious people will be achieved by pretending that it does not matter, that it's simply epiphenomenal, as scholars would put it, that what matters to people are economic, political, and other kinds of interest. Religion does matter, and we have to take it as that which matters. Positively, if religion matters, we have to find resources for conviviality of religious people within each faith tradition itself. This is where the significance of the common word comes in. One, it points both Muslims and Christians to what is undeniably essential in each faith and common to both, love of God and love of neighbor. It shows that that which is essential in each faith and common to both moreover binds them together and encourages them, indeed demands of them, that they live seeking good, not only of their own community, but also of others. So the consequence of the agreement that the dual command of love binds two faiths together is weighty, even revolutionary in the best sense of that term. The deeper your faith is, and by deeper I mean here more intelligent, more informed faith, the deeper your faith is, the more, it, it's not the case the deeper your faith is, that the more at odds you will be with others. To the contrary, we must say, the deeper your faith is, the more in harmony with others you will live. A deep faith no longer needs to clashes. A deep faith now fosters conviviality. Now, lest someone think that this is a too quick and somewhat cheap triumph of religion over conflict, let me make plain what I'm not saying about love of God and love of neighbor in Christianity and Islam. First, having love of God and neighbor in common does not mean being somehow amalgamated into a single, the same religion. Even if there is significant agreement, and maybe there is only convergence and not agreement on love of God and love of neighbor, many differences still remain. Differences that are not simply accidental, but that are fundamental to the faith itself, each of the faiths itself. They define that faith. For instance, Christians continue to believe that the one and unique God who is utterly exalted above all created being, that that one God is the Holy Trinity, and that God has shown unconditional love for humanity in that Jesus Christ, as God's Lamb, bore the sins of the world. Muslims generally do not share these beliefs. Similarly, Muslims revere Prophet Muhammad as the seal of the prophets and the Quran as the sacred scripture, whereas Christians generally do not do that. 
Love does not erase these differences, but it enables people to accept others in their differences. It enables us to, them to get to know others in their differences, and it enables them to live together harmoniously, notwithstanding their differences. Second, to affirm love of God and neighbor, that it is common to Christianity and Islam, and of course Judaism, is not to say that all the practical problems that cause tensions between these two communities have therefore been resolved. Many thorny issues remain, and they remain to be sorted out. Large and small wars in which Christians and Muslims are involved, as well as aftermaths of these wars, persecution and lack of religious freedom, problems around evangelism and dawah, and many others. Common commitment to love of God and love of neighbor does not eliminate these conflicts as with some magic wand. What it does is this. It provides a basis on which these issues can be productively discussed. And for those of you who have been with us during the workshop, you have seen that this incipient common commitment to love of God and love of neighbor has indeed made possible very fruitful and very hard but very fruitful discussions on some of those very tough issues. Moreover, that commitment offers a way, commitment to love God and love neighbor, it offers a way to hold each other accountable to our best intentions. A Muslim target of Christian verbal attacks can say to a Christian, how can you claim that you love me when you only speak ill of my God? when you malign my prophet, when you despise my way of life. A Christian, a convert from Islam, can now say to a hostile Muslim, how can you say that you love me if you want to kill me because I have followed my conscience and embraced Christian faith? Common commitment to love of neighbor has real consequences on the ground. If practiced, it would have diffused many serious conflict of global reach, as the example of Danish cartoons of the Prophet Muhammad illustrates. So what some people deride as an impractical and soft commitment to love of God and neighbor, and we all religious people know that it is nothing like soft and that it is nothing like impractical, this kind of commitment, commitment to benevolence and beneficence has tangible, real effects in diffusing conflicts and fostering conviviality. It makes possible what would otherwise remain elusive in a world in which faith traditions continue to be vibrant. We can embrace both deep faith and respect the rights of those who do not share it. Deep faith expresses itself in love, and love, understood as benevolence and beneficence, leads to respect of others' rights. Put differently, and maybe to some of you somewhat surprisingly, commitment to properly understood love of God and love of neighbor makes deeply religious persons, just because they are deeply religious per per persons, into dedicated social pluralists. This is why when Muslims and Christians commit themselves to love of God and of neighbor, they're not satisfying some private religious fancy. Indeed, they're actively, actively fostering conviviality in our interdependent, pluralistic world plagued by deep divisions and collaboration, and they foster collaboration of people of different faiths in the common public space and for the common good. I don't think it's too much to say that the common word process has potential to become a historic watershed, defining the relations between two numerically largest faiths in the world today for the good of all humanity. Whether it will actually become historic or not will depend on all of us, Muslims as well as Christians, and what we do with that process. The common word is a seed that would either die or grow into a great tree under whose branches many will be able to find shade. Or, to change the metaphor, it will either gather the mounting dust of history or become a common platform for which to address effectively not just many areas of tensions between Muslims and Christians, 
but also many of the burning issues in our interconnected world. Which of these possibilities will be realized? That will depend on the reception of the document in the Muslim and Christian communities. I hope that this conference will become one important milestone in the reception of the common word, a contribution to helping commitment to love God, of God and neighbor open up a new future, a new future for Muslims, for Muslim, for Christian, for Jewish communities, a future in which swords will be turned into plowshares and clashes will be replaced by conviviality. A common word about common love of God and neighbor will then become a catalyst for a better common future. Thank you very much. I want to present to you uh, now my dear friend, His Royal Highness, Prince Ghazi. It has been a pleasure working with him, and more importantly, it has been a pleasure getting to know him as a friend. As I've said in my talk, he is a man of deep faith and of extraordinary practical wisdom. I have learned a great deal from him during our exchanges and have been stimulated in many ways uh, to promote both the understanding between Muslims and Christians and also to experience deeper my own Christian faith. Prince Ghazi. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim wa salatu wa salamu ala khatim al-anbiya wa al-Muslimin Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Pax Fabiskum Let me start by praising God, alhamdulillah, for everything and then by thanking those more than 300, 500, Mirisla I've just said Christian scholars and leaders who generously responded on November the 18th, 2007 in the New York Times to the A Common Word initiative of October the 13th, 2007. It was this gracious response that opened the way for the current conference. More particularly, for the current historical conference, we are indebted to President Levin of Yale University and Dean Harold Attridge of the Yale Divinity School for their support and vision to Professor Emily Towns, to Roseanne Moore, to Dr. Andrew Saperstein, to Dr. Rick Love, to Mahan Mirza, to the excellent logistical staff behind the conference, in particular Amanda Jones, Melissa Yarrington, and Lindsay Cleveland, to Targil Johari and Nuri Friedlander, and the excellent team who have been helping the team at Yale with everything, to my own team, particularly Dr. Caesar, Barry Han, and Matt Collins for follow-up on the Muslim side. To Dr. Joseph Cumming, the director of the reconciliation program, who has worked night and day over the last nine months to make all of this happen, by the grace of God. And most of all, to our very good friend, Professor Miroslav Wolf, who has been the driving force behind all of this, acting with true Christian caritas towards Muslims, which we admire and appreciate without for all that abandoning his Christian fervor, but rather as a necessary part of it. Permit me also to thank Miroslav's mother, Mrs. Wolf, for her encouragement and prayers. Finally, I would like to thank my friend, Mr. Tim Collins, who funded a good part of this conference and the work behind it. Without his support and vision, none of this would have been possible. God says in the Holy Quran, وَاللَّهُ يَدْعُوا إِلَى دَعِ السَّلَامِ وَيَهْدِ مَنْ يَشَاءُ إِلَى سِرَاطِ مُسْتَقِيمِ and going to a straight path this conference is in fact the first of a number of important events and meetings based on a common word including God willing meetings at Cambridge University and Lambeth Palace in October 
the Vatican in November, Georgetown University in March 2009, and possibly, inshallah, the baptism site in Jordan in 2009 or 2010. I would like to say here at the onset that in sending out via common word missive, that the intention in sending out via common word missive was simply to try to make peace between Muslims and Christians globally. It was and is an extended global handshake of religious goodwill, friendship and fellowship and consequently of interreligious peace. Of course, peace is primarily a matter for governments. But Huntington's 1993 vision of global conflict between Muslims and Christians was wrong in one important sense. Post-September 11, 2001, the only government as such which has opposed the West in its various demands is that of Iran, though even Iran has sided with the West against terrorism. Fifty-four other Islamic nations have not done so. That is to say then that the governments of Islamic majority countries have not banded together against the governments of Christian majority countries, much less in alliance with China, nor indeed vice versa. Nevertheless, Huntington was very correct in his prediction of heightened tensions between Christians and Muslim everywhere globally after the collapse of atheistic communism, albeit with religiously affiliated non-government actors taking the lead. Indeed, there seems to be five major factors driving global religious tensions. Number one, Jerusalem and the question of Palestine. Number two, discontentment with U.S. foreign policy, especially the war in Iraq. Number three, terrorism. Number four, fundamentalism on all sides. And number five, missionary activity on all sides. Thus now, according to the results of the largest international religious surveys in history, as outlined in the seminal book by Professor John Esposito and Dalia Mujahid, 60% of Christians harbor prejudice against Muslims and 30% of Muslims reciprocate. Now every student of history knows and good readers of the eighth book of Plato's Republic will surmise that with such an explosive mix, popular religious conflicts, even unto genocide, are lurking around the corner. Indeed, one such happened a few hundred miles away from where the Pope sits 15 years ago in the heart of Europe, when 300,000 innocent Muslim civilians were slaughtered and 100,000 Bosnian women were raped as a method of war. We are honored to have here with us the Grand Mufti of Bosnia. Please ask him about it. And my feeling is that, God forbid, a few more terrorist attacks, a few more national security emergencies, a few more demagogues, a few more national protection laws, and then internment camps, if not concentration camps, are not inconceivable in some places and that these would inevitably spawn endless global counter-reactions. The Holocaust of six million Jews, then the largest religious minority in Europe, 65 years ago, still within living memory, is something that Muslims in the West now should contemplate as seriously as Jews do. For unfortunately, we are not now immune to the crimes of the past, and our nature and worst potential has not fundamentally changed. Moreover, as the Gallup survey showed, we are now actually at the stage where we, as Christians and Muslims, routinely mistrust, disrespect, and dislike each other, if not popularly and actively rubbish, dehumanize, demonize, despise, and attack each other. This is the stage where Hutus and Tutsis, both Christian tribes by their own confessions, were at in Rwanda before the popular genocide by machete of nearly a million people in 1994. How much easier 
would it be for Muslims and Christians who have been fighting for over a millennia and have viewed each other with the deepest suspicions since St. John of Damascus to slaughter each other? And how much more likely will this be when we are all finally struck with the apparent looming catastrophes of global climate change and when the competition, when the competition for food and natural resources becomes more fierce? Indeed, it hasn't escaped many of us that there have already been some prominent voices in the West and in the Islamic world calling for this. This is the background behind the launching of a common word. It was addressed from religious leaders to religious leaders of the two largest religions in the world in the recognition that whilst religious leaders do not generally make public policy, they are nevertheless still the ultimate touchstones for morality and thus the final safety net for public opinion and non-government actors. <clears throat> this is not politics by other means, but rather politics that recognizes that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that issueth from the mouth of God. It was not intended, <clears throat> it was not intended, as some have misconstrued, to trick Christians or to foist Muslim theology on them, or even to convert them to Islam. Neither was it intended, as Muslim just said, to reduce both our religions to an artificial union based on the two commandments. Indeed, in Matthew 22:40, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, and his salam was quite specific. On these two commandments hang all the prophets, all the law and all the prophets. Hang, not are reduced to. It was simply an attempt to find a theologically correct and pre-existing essential common ground, albeit perhaps interpreted differently, between Islam and Christianity, rooted in our sacred texts and in their common Abrahamic origin, in order to stop our own deep-rooted religious mutual suspicions from being an impediment towards behaving properly towards each other. It was and is an effort to ensure that religions behave as part of the problem and are not misused to become part of the solution. Indeed, the two commandments give us guidelines and a shared standard not only to what to expect from each other, but also to how we ourselves must be and behave. We started with Christianity bilaterally simply because Islam and Christianity are the largest two religions in the world and in history. And so in that sense, Islamic-Christian dialogue is the most critical. But this does not preclude our having other conversations with those of other faiths, bilaterally or multilaterally, or even with those with no faith at all. Indeed, we have, for example, been having a conversation with His Holiness the Dalai Lama and other Buddhists, whom on the surface of things, Islam has a lot less in common with than with Christianity. And I'd like to say this, he's a lot nicer than you Christians. <laughs> I, would, I would like to say also that a common word does not signal that Muslims are prepared to deviate from or concede one iota, one atom of their convictions in reaching out to Christians. Nor I expect the opposite. Let's be crystal clear. A common word is about equal peace, not about capitulation. Indeed, some have suggested that our framing, our extended hand in the language of love is such a concession. But I assure you that this is not at all accurate, nor is it a concession. Rather, it has been a particular joy to be able to focus in our initiative on this frequently underestimated aspect of our religion, the principle of love. Indeed, we have over 50 mere synonyms for love in the Holy Quran. English does not have the same linguistic riches and connotations as we have already seen in the workshops. And as I'm sure we will discover together here in the remainder of these Yale days, if Muslims do not usually use the same language of love as Christians in English, 
It is perhaps because the word love frequently implies different things for Muslims than it does for Christians. Our use, then, of the language of love in a common word is simply a recognition that human beings have the same souls everywhere, however corrupted or pure, and thus that the experience of love must have something in common everywhere, even if the objects of love are different, and even if the ultimate love of God is stronger than all other loves. God says in the Holy Quran, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَتَّخْذُ مِنْ دُونِ اللَّهِ أَنْدَادًا يُحِبُّونَهُمْ كَحُبِّ اللَّهِ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا أَشَدُّ حُبًّا لِلَّهِ Yet of mankind are some who take unto themselves objects of worship which they set as rivals to God, loving them with a love like that which is due to God only. But those who believe in God are stauncher in their love for God. Now I would like to recognize and introduce some of the Muslim guests here, starting with those coming from the Islamic world. We have from Algeria, His Excellency, the Algerian Minister of Religious Affairs, Dr. Bugulam Abdullah, who is one of the unsung heroes of the Islamic world, for he has helped to reconcile the people of Algeria after a long and brutal civil war that has killed tens of thousands of people. Also from Algeria, we have His Excellency Professor Dr. Sayyid Mustafa Sharif, former ambassador, former minister of education, expert on the Vatican, and one of the leading intellectuals and thinkers of the Arab world. From, e from Egypt, we have Dr. Salam Shaka, Egypt's under minister for foreign affairs, one of the leading scholarly female voices in the Arab world. From, from Morocco, we have Dr. Taha Abdihman. Dr. Taha is one of the most famous, most respected, most influential, and most beloved philosophical minds in the Islamic world today. From Morocco, also, also from Morocco, we have Professor Farouk Hamada, one of the leading experts on the crucial science of Islamic hadith in the world. From Azerbaijan, we have Allah Shakur Bashsada, the Grand Mufti, not only of Azerbaijan, but of the whole Caucasus region by election. He is the world's only Sunni Shia Grand Mufti. He gives Sunnis a Sunni answer and Shia a Shia answer to their questions. He is a paragon of religious plurality. From Bosnia, we have Grand Mufti of Bosnia, Dr. Mustafa Sharif, uh, Dr. M Dr. Mustafa Church. Or well, even now, because <laughs> he messed up my name in one of these conferences. <laughs> he is another hero. He suffered and fought in the Bosnian genocide. Then he fought in his heart and forgave, and today he fights for peace as the senior religious authority of Europe's 20 million Muslims. From Kosovo, the world's newest state, we have Sheikh Naim Travna, who comes here despite the tensions and the delicate situation in his own country, which we all very much appreciate. From Palestine, we have his Eminence Chief Justice of Palestine, Taysir Tamimi, Sheikh Taysir Tamimi, a formidable and highly experienced figure who has of late been involved in interfaith dialogue and co cooperation between Muslims, Christians, and Jews. From in Indonesia, we have Professor Dean Shamsuddin, the brilliant head, the youngest ever of the Muhammadiyya party, the second largest party in Indonesia with 30 million members. F from from Nigeria, we have my dear friend, Prince Bola Ajibola, the former Vice President of the International High Court of Justice at La Hague, the former Nigerian Minister of Justice and Attorney General, the founder of both the Islamic Movement of Africa and the Crescent University. From Iran, we have Ayatollah Professor Said Mustafa Muhakkak Damad, the former Attorney General of Iran, and now perhaps the leading philosopher and expert on Shiite Iqfan in Iran, if not the world. From Pakistan, we have Dr. Hafiz Hamid Suhail Omar, the director of the prestigious Iqbal Academy, a gentleman and a man of exemplary virtue. From Afghanistan, we have Professor Muhammad Hashim Kamali, who is recognized as the greatest expert on the relationship between Sharia and modern law in the world, and has written the best and most acclaimed books on the subject. From Gambia, we have Professor and Ambassador Omar Jha, the head of the Muslim scholars in that country, and many other things, and a much beloved leader all over the Islamic world. 
From Yemen, from Yemen, we have Sheikh Habib Ali Jeffrey. Habib Ali, Habib Ali needs no introduction. He is one of the top ten most popular preachers in the Islamic world, and amongst this group, he is by far the youngest. From Libya, we have the brilliant Professor Arif Naid, a leading pioneer in the field of Muslim-Christian relations, and the first Muslim ever to graduate with a PhD from the Gregorian in the Vatican. From Tunisia, we have Professor Hamid Naifa, one of the leading Muslim theologians in the world and a historical figure in the Islamic movement of Tunisia. From Turkey, we have Dr. Bahim Kalin, the director of CETA, the leading Turkish think tank, and a professor at Georgetown University. He's a brilliant scholar. He's a brilliant scholar, administrator, political expert, and musician. He's our spokesman. He's our group spokesman for the conference. From Oman, we have Sheikh Ahmed bin Saud al-Siyabi, the Secretary General of the Directorate of the Grand Mufti, representing the Grand Mufti, Sheikh Ahmed al-Khalili, and thus representing the ultimate Sharia authority in the Ibadi Madhab. From the United Arab Emirates, we have Professor Muhammad Abdul Rahim Sultan al ulama Deputy Dean of Scientific Research Affairs, UAE University, sign of an illustrious family of scholars and himself one of the leading Shafi'i scholars in the Arab world. From Syria, we have Dr. Salahuddin al Kuftaw, who has the Kuftaw Foundation, founded by his great father, the late Grand Mufti of Syria, Ahmed al Kuftaw, and who has the much needed Islamic Center for Peace. Originally from India, then Mozambique, then Portugal, then the UK, and now Jordan. We have uh, Suhail Nahuda, the founder and editor in chief of what I think is widely recognized as the best magazine in the Islamic world, Islamica. From Jordan, we have Senator Kamil Ajlouni, the founder and the first president of Jordan. University of Science and Technology, the founder of Jordan's National Diabetes Center, and who was recognized only this year as the greatest endocrinologist in the world by the American Board of Endocrology. He has written ex extensively on sexual issues in Islam and Christianity, and will no doubt remind us that whilst Christians and Muslims both reject modern science's view of love as merely heightened or sublimated lust, nevertheless, we must all recognize how our souls are generally habitually dominated, if not determined, by our bodies in our lives, to the extent at least that we have not achieved liberation and enlightenment. From Muslim minority countries in Asia, we have Amin Rasul from the Philippines, whose voice is a leading one for peace, reconciliation, and democracy. In that country, where Muslims are beset on all sides. From Europe now, we have Dr. Mohammed Bishari of France, who seems to be the head of everything connected with French Muslims and even European Muslims, uh, and who I know has just founded the Avicenna the Avicenna Center in Paris. From Belgium, we have Dr. Mohammed Elwani Sharif, the head of the European Academy of Islamic Culture and Sciences, who has been one of the most influential Muslim intellectuals and scholars of Europe in recent decades. From Denmark, we have Dr. Ismatullah Mujaddidi, who as president of the Council for Danish Muslims, has been the calm in the eye of the storm caused by the sacrilegious cartoons in Denmark two years ago. From Italy, we have Imam Yahya Paravicini, a leading Muslim activist and author, seeking always and in every way to make peace between Muslims and Christians. From Great Britain, we have Sheikh Abdul Hakim Murad, the Sheikh Zayed Lecturer in Islamic Studies at Cambridge University, who is widely recognized as being the most knowledgeable and influential native Muslim Western European in the world. Also from Britain, we have Dr. Sayyid Reza Shah Qazimi, the author of four or five seminal and prize-winning books on such topics as Mercy in the Holy Quran, the Quran Interfaith Dialogue, Imam Ali and Spirituality, and Comparative Mysticism. Finally from Britain, we have Dr. Naveed Sheikh, one of the most brilliant upcoming historians of his generation. He joins us here because a dialogue like ours cannot proceed without historical memory. And since we have centuries of history together as Christians and Muslims, we must in justice in our discussions be aware of the past in order to better work for the present or the future. 
I will not introduce the 15 or so U.S. or Canadian Muslim figures because you probably know them better than I do, but I will just briefly recognize them and thank them for coming. Professor Sayyid Hussein Nas, uh, widely recognized as the greatest scholar in Islam in the world, he's here. Um, Professor Ingrid Mattson, scholar, president of ISNA, and modern role model for the whole Islamic world. Sheikh Muzam al-Siddiqui, the historic founder of the North American Fatwa Council, distinguished professor Abdullah Schleifer, one of the greatest minds on media in our age. Uh, the charismatic and now very famous Imam Faisal Abdul Rauf of New York, founder of the Cordoba Initiative. Ali Lakhani from Canada, the founder and editor of the Sacred Web Journal. Professor Alan Godless of Georgetown University, the founder of the most acclaimed website in Islam in the world and one of the leading translators in the world. Some brilliant upcoming scholars in their 30s, my former colleagues Joseph Lombard and Professor Janet Dagley. And the next generation, inshallah, of future scholars and leaders, Dr. Sham Hilya, Dr. Ahmed Rumi, Dr. Aisha Chaudhry, Dr. Mun Hassan, and Zarina Nala. Last but not least, Dalia Mujahid, the Gallup Muslim World Poll Di Director, who was mentioned earlier, is along with Professor John Esposito because of her work, the person most qualified in the world to tell the world what Muslims really think and feel. Finally, I would like to welcome OIC Ambassador, His Excellency Saadid Din Tayyib, and Saudi representatives, Dr. Anwar Majdi, Majid Ashki, President of the Middle East Center for Strategic and Legal Studies, and Dr. Sadiq Malki, Professor of Political Science at King Abdul Aziz University. I would like to welcome Dr. Ali Abdul Baqi from the Azhar. Their presence with us as observers is a mark of how seriously the Islamic world, and in particular the top leadership at the OIC in Saudi Arabia, and the Azhar, is taking this dialogue. Please forgive me if I have left anyone out. There have been many changes and cancellations at the last minute, and it's hard to keep track. I have to say, however, that some of our most senior fuqaha scholars of Sharia did not attend. Being of a certain age, to no longer easily endure what Muslims have had to endure at airports since 9-11, they have instead sent supporting letters. However, had they known how well we have been treated by Homeland Security this week, more would have come, and more will come, and for this we would like to thank the US government. In closing then, let me quote from one of these great fuqaha, Sheikh Muhammad Saeed Ramadan al-Bouti of Syria in a letter written to this conference, which I know has been distributed. He says, let us come together, brothers and sisters, to contemplate deeply before the mirror of our essential nature, in order to, to rediscover our true identity, which has been lost in the storms of discord and caprice. This mirror will show us all our reality and say, we are all servants of God. We move under the grip of his dominion, and we live within the bounds of his kingdom, and all our journeys will end at his presence. God reveals in the Quran, in the Holy Quran, in Kullu man fis samawati wal arda illa ati rahman abda, laqad ahsahum wa addahum adda, wa kulluhum atihi yawm al qiyamati fagda, inna alladina amanu wa aminu al salihati sayaj ala lahum al rahman wudda. There is none in the heavens and earth but cometh to the all compassionate as a servant. Verily he knoweth them and numbereth them with the right numbering. And each one of them will come unto him on the day of resurrection alone. Lo, those who believe and do good works, the all compassionate will grant them love. Thank you.